Question one is looking at the change in uh, the voltage when we load up a transformer. So why does it change? It's because of the current flow through the impedance of the winding. So at full load, we get lots of current, lots of volt drop due to that impedance, and so we get a lower terminal voltage. B, 230 volts plug-in heater. It's got an output of 2 kilowatts. The supply voltage can fluctuate between 230 and 240. So what's going to be the effect on the power? Well, the power is going to vary not just by the increase in voltage, but by the square of the change in voltage. So it's that change in voltage squared. Main reason why effectively earthing the metal frame of class 1 appliance prevents electric shock. So if we get fault condition, it prevents the voltage of the frame of the appliance and uh, from rising above, and they always say near zero volts. So it keeps that voltage at near zero volts by earth in the frame. Which of the following methods will change the, the direction of rotation of a three phase induction motor? So, three phases, how do we? It's sort of about reversing um, two phases. So, change the control circuit from 230 to 400? No. Change the phase sequence of the incoming supply? Yes, that will change the rotation. Reverse the polarity of one motor winding? No. Interchange two phases on the motor terminal block? Yes. So, that will change the phase is over and so it will reverse the motor. So that needs two answers there. Um, state the effect of operation of free phase motor if the load torque ex exceeds the pull out torque. So if the load torque that we um, need is bigger than this pull out torque then if it was um, starting if, we, if that was to happen on starting, it wouldn't start. It wouldn't be able to overcome the load torque. If it was running, then it would stall. F, the main reasons why an earth fault loop impedance test is carried out of the switchboard. So we want to, when we're talking about the switchboard, so if you see that earth fault loop impedance at the switchboard, it's to verify that the KA, the killer amp rating of the protective device, capable of safely, safely interrupting the prospective short circuit current. So we get a reading of a fault loop impedance and that tells us how much prospective short circuit current could flow and then we want to make sure that the protective devices are able to take that current under fault conditions. Why is the air fault loop impedance carried out of the socket outlet furthest away from the switchboard? So what we're looking for there is, is the time for operate. So we're making sure that that earth fault loop impedance is low enough to give us enough current so that the protective devices will operate in the required time. H, um, we've got uh, a prospective short circuit current rating for the installation. So why is it important? It's so that the uh, prospective uh, short circuit current is um, not bigger than the rating of the protective devices to make sure that those protective devices are capable of taking that much current under full conditions. Inverse time characteristic, so that means that the bigger the current, the, s the quicker the device will operate. So as the current increases, the time to operate decreases. J, we've got fluorescent fittings above um, or in the factory. How do we reduce the stroboscopic effect? So we can have a lead, lead lag fittings. We can have incandescent lighting, so filament lighting with the fluorescent lighting. We can have electronic ballasts. Um, in double fittings, capacitor connected with one ballast. So we, we, we need to change or make one of the currents out of phase with the other current so that it's not flickering at that 100 hertz. Question two, we've got a conveyor, a three phase induction motor, and we the two reasons, the variable frequency supply. So the amount of metal delivered by the conveyor can be varied by varying the speed of the converter, uh, sorry, conveyor. The amount of metal delivered by the conveyor is constant at a set speed. 
So we're going to state two factors that are varied by a variable frequency controller to alter the speed. Now when you vary the frequency on a variable frequency controller to keep the torque constant, we need to vary the voltage as well. So to vary the, the speed, to keep, keep the constant torque, we need to vary, vary the voltage and the frequency. Part two, we've got the, the components, and so we've got We've got a rectifier there, we've got a diode, and we've got a smoothing circuit there, so we've got a coil and a capacitor. And C, we've got an inverter that's going to um, put it back to AC. So we've rectified, smoothed, we've got a nice smooth DC here that we can control, and we can put it back to AC there, but a variable frequency AC. And we can vary it using this control circuit here. What is the purpose of component C? So that's changing this DC back to a, a free phase AC supply. What's the effect on the conveyor motor if it's operated at low speeds for external periods? So any motor that's operated at low speeds, there's less um, windage from the, if it's fan operated, um, and so the motor can overheat. You've got less air flowing, flowing through. So although it's, it's taking a lower load and a smaller current usually, it will, will overheat. Three technical advantages of an electronic um, soft starter compared to an auto transformer. So an auto transformer is only going to give us two stages of starting the low and high if you like. But electronic soft starter is going to be nice and smooth. Um, so they've given easier to control the starting current, easier to control the starting torque. Multiple variations of the time it takes from rest to full speed or full torque. So it's not going to just be that low high. It's going to be multiple variations. So there's going to be less shock to the equipment. You're going to get a more even torque applied and less disruption to the supply voltage. Free phase motor is started by star delta star to stay one reason why interlocks. So we've got interlocks in the star delta so that we can't have the star and delta contactors in together, operating simultaneously. It could either be star or delta. The mechanical um, interlock will make sure that both can't be in at the same time. Two safety features of an MEN system. So voltage to earth, any part of the installation is limited to 230. The voltage potential between neutral and earth is about zero volts, or near zero volts, and the low impedance main neutral ensures protective um, devices operate effectively. So it gives us a low impedance fault path to give us lots of current, to give us less time for that protective device to operate. Two potentially hazardous situations that can occur when the MEN uh, supplies an electrical insulation. Well, because we have such a low impedance, we can get dangerously high fault currents. So there is the risk of fire through any high resistance joint in the system. Sometimes no indication that the insulation main neutral is open circuited. So we could lose that main neutral at any point and we wouldn't know. There's always the danger of a phase neutral transposition on the mains. Someone could remove the MEN link or in fact not install it in the first place. So we're relying on that MEN link to be in there. Which type of switchboard must be electrically closest? So that is the MEN switchboard is electrically closest to the point of supply. In low voltage MEN system the neutral is earthed at which points in the low voltage MEN distribution system is the neutral earthed. So it's earthed at the star point it must be earthed on one or at least one on the distribution neutrals and at each inst electrical installation must have an earthing of the MEN. Other than the supply voltage state, two other factors that determine the level of prospective short circuit current in an electrical installation. So we've looked at this many times before, the capacity of, of the supply, the KVA of the supply, how much it can push out the impedance of the earth fault loop and the impedance of the mains. So the impedance are going to try and stop the current. The, the capacity, the KVA, is, is trying to push it out and 
working together, they will determine the prospective short circuit current. Part E, why don't we need an earth on the class two? Um, double insulated because we've got this supplementary insulation between that basic insulation and any metal that could become life. And we don't um, put it on there. We don't earth a class two because it would negate the safety design of the appliance. So you could explain it either way. Figure B for question four. So it's a, a DOL starter, motor starter, and we're going to put in a remote start-stop station. So what we're going to do there, we're going to remove one conductor from the installation. So this one here, we want it to go through this start button, but before it goes to the stop button, we want to be able to go to this remote set of buttons. So if we look at the answer, there's our start original start, and we put a second start in parallel with that. So the phase can either go through the one we've got there or through that remote one there. Coming down here, we take this out because we, can't, we want the current to flow through this stop and this stop. So the stops here are in series. And then that series circuit continues back to the point where we cut it, cut it off there. So we put the, the starts in parallel and the stops in series. In series with this stop that's already in there and the overload in the coil. Three phase induction motor is controlled by a star delta. State would occur if the main contact are engaged, but the star contact or did not engage, and the timer eventually engaged the delta. So what's going to happen, it isn't going to start in star, it's not going to start with 230 volts on the windings, it's going to go straight to delta after that time, and so it's going to attempt to start direct online. So it's going to operate like a direct online starter. Question four, three phase motor, 400 volts, 50 hertz, we've got the efficiency, an input power and a line current, and we've got to calculate the output power. So we know the input power and we know the efficiency. So the output power is going to be basically 84% of that 9.52. So it's going to be 9.52 times the, the decimal of that 84, the per unit, so it's 84 divided by 100, or just 0.84, gives us 8 kilowatts. We're asked to calculate the power factor. Now, the, the main formula, the original formula, is power is root three, VL, IL, power factor. So we need to transpose for this power factor here. And all we need to do is to take all these three terms, the root three, VL, IL, take them underneath the power when they go to the other side. So it becomes power divided by root three, VL, IL, equals power factor. So we've got that 9520, which is our power, divided by root 3 times 400, which is our line voltage, and our line current, 16.96, that we get from the question. Let's have a look at those. So we've got our 400 volts line voltage, and we've got our 16.96 amps line current, which is there. We do 9520. Now I would say bracket all these numbers at the bottom there or find that answer and then do 9520 divided by that answer and you should get 0.81 which is the power factor and the power factor has no no units the input kva now kva is kilowatts over power factor so we're going to use that power factor we just found there kilowatts is 9.52 divided by that 0.81 it gives us 11.75 kva Question five, we've got 40 amp um, RCCB and 20 amp MCB, protector 230 volt final sub-circuit. We've got six socket outlets um, with various appliances and two fixed wire electrical appliances. The MCB is tripped. All the plug-in electrical appliances were disconnected. So it can't be any of those. When the MCB is reset, it trips again when the supply is restored to the final sub-circuit. 
So it's none of these plug-in appliances, it must be something to do with these fixed wire appliances. The MCB is not faulty and correctly rated for the circuit, overload is not an issue. So what have we got to do? If the fault was located in the fixed wire appliance, what procedure would you use to determine where the fault is? So again, we've got this test instruments with multiple functions, and we're going to have to test this to find out the fault. So I'd be looking at insulation resistance. Um, so my test procedure, we're going to disconnect the fixed wire appliances. We're going to test each one in turn using the insulation resistance function. I would say use the 500 volt range and test between phase and neutral. Now because we're looking for a fault, we're looking for a resistance that's low and they suggest less than 5 ohms for the fault. This, this could be anything. But if we get a value, a low value, then we should investigate further because that's going to show a fault. Between phase and neutral, with the um, with it turned off, we should get higher higher resistance than that. The you found the fault was not located in the fixed wire appliance. So what would you use to determine where the fault is in the final sub circuit? So we've tested the the the, the, the fixed wire appliances. Their resistance is high. Insulation resistance has passed. Now we're going to test the. Um, sub circuit the final sub circuit so we're going to disconnect that final sub circuit at the switchboard and again we're going to use insulation resistance uh, function tester 500 volts dc and we're going to test between phase and neutral with those disconnected and if there's a fault there we're going to get a low resistance so it's going to be a short somewhere between phase and neutral Number six, electrician has repaired a 400 volt free phase induction motor in a workshop and we're required to connect a new four core flexible core to the motor and reconnect it to an existing DOL, direct online starter. A lockable isolator is located adjacent to the DOL. There are no danger tags or locks attached to the isolator. Two tests um, to carry out using test instruments out on the flexible cord and motor to ensure they're safe to connect to the DOL. State the order in which the tests are carried out. So you always need to do the protective earthing conductor test before you do the insulation resistance test. Because if the protective earthing conductor is faulty, say that's broken, then you're never going to pick up a fault in the insulation test. There could be a short circuit could be an insulation breakdown on a short circuit, but you wouldn't see it in the meter because the earth conductor is broke. So always do protective earth and conductor first, then insulation resistance. So then they want you to explain one of the tests. So my favorite is the insulation resistance test. So I would do that one. Insulation resistance tester, 500 volts DC, testing between each conductor of the flexible cord in the frame of the motor and looking for a test result of 1 mega ohms or more. But you could do the protective earthing conductor, ohm meter, testing the PCE conductor, PC conductor, looking for a, a result 1 ohms or less. State the sequence of actions you must take before connecting the cord to the DOL. So you must ensure the isolator is in the off position, and you must use the proof test proof. So anywhere it says actions to take to ensure your own safety when it's about disconnection or connection, you're always going to use the prove test prove method to make sure that it's isolated. You're going to attach a danger tag to the isolator and lock the isolator in the off position. C, you've connected the motor flexible cord to the DOL starter but not live in the circuit. Describe the test you need to carry out to ensure that in the event of a fault developing on the motor, the motor electrical protection will operate. So we're going to use an ohm meter, and we're going to make sure that the earth conductor uh, is low enough resistance. So we're going to test between an earth not associated with the motor final subcircuit 
and the frame of the motor. So a nerve that's not part of that circuit and the frame of the motor and make sure that is one ohms or one ohm or less. Number seven, we've got a new factory that's got some important machinery that operates at a voltage other than standard low voltage, so it's not going to be our 230 volts, so we need a dedicated supply. We've got a 150 kVA free phase delta star transformer. We've got a turns ratio of 43.3 to 1 and a primary voltage of 11 kV. So we need to find the secondary phase voltage. Now we know the primary phase voltage of a delta connected transformer is the same as the line voltage. So line voltage is equal to phase voltage. So we've got um, 100, uh, no, where are we? We've got 11 kV on the phase of the primary. So the secondary phase is going to be that 11 kV divided by that turns ratio. So it's going to be 43.3 times less turns on the secondary as there is on the primary. So that gives us 254 volts secondary phase voltage. The secondary line voltage is going to be root 3 bigger than that because it's a star system and the line voltage is root 3 bigger than the phase voltage. So 254 times root 3 gives us 440 volts. The primary line current, well, we're going to transpose that formula, that uh, the KVA is IL, VL, power factor times root 3. We're going to transpose that to give us IL. So IL is going to be equal to KVA divided by root 3 times VL. So it gives us 150K divided by root 3 times the line voltage in the primary is the 11,000. So that gives us 7.87. So that's the primary VL, which was 11, 11 kV. The secondary line current is going to be the same formula, except we're going to use the secondary line voltage. So we're looking for the secondary line current, so we use the secondary line voltage, 150,000 divided by root 3 times 440, which is what we found up here. And that gives us 196.83 amps. Part E, form of cooling, so how could we cool that? We could use air convection and oil immersion, so those the uh, windings could be in oil, and we've just got natural air going across it, could just have natural air convection, no oil, or oil immersion. Question 8, we want a half controlled single phase full wave bridge. So don't get confused with the half and the full there. Half controlled means that only half of the diodes within the circuit are replaced with thyristors, SCRs, silicon control rectifiers. Uh, the con so that we can control these two, and so we can control the current and the voltage for uh, each half of the load. So what we got here is we've got our transformer, we've got our four components, and when it's positive, it's going to flow through this SCR, and it's going to flow down the load here, and back through this diode. And when it's negative, it's going to flow through this one, through our load, and back through our diode. So it goes through two components for each half of the waveform, but each half of the waveform can be controlled by just controlling one of these. If we turn this one off, then we'll lose half of the waveform, if we turn this one off, we we'll lose the other half. So that would be our circuit diagram, and our positive would be at the top there, because when this is positive, it's going through this one. So the current is always flowing down at this point. We want the 
output waveform at half output. So we're firing these SCRs at 90 degrees. So for the first 90 degrees, nothing gets through the circuit. Then when we fire it, we allow the second half of the waveform through. So again, nothing for the first half, fire it 90 degrees later, we get this through. So we get half of the waveform through. What component can be used as part of a circuit to filter? So we can use an inductor, capacitor, or resistor. I would say inductor and capacitor are the two best options. One factor would cause an SCR to be turned off once it's been triggered. Now, the only thing that's going to turn it off is the current going down to zero, or at least less than the holding current, which is near zero, and if we take away the voltage. So it will stay on, it doesn't need, it only needs to be fired momentarily, it will stay on until that current and voltage go, go to zero. Danger tags and outer service tags are designed to promote safety in the workplace. So where would we use a danger tag? So it's where there's a possibility of personnel danger through the supply being restored. So if someone's going to be working near there, and if we turn it on, um, they're going to... Um, there's going to be a danger of an accident, then we need the danger tag. Out of service tag is when the equipment is faulty or damaged, and using that equipment would cause damage or injury. Two precautions to be taken when attaching a danger tag to an isolating switch. So make sure it's the correct isolating switch that you tag. Make sure it's in the off position. Fasten it securely so it doesn't come off test to ensure isolation has taken place and make sure your appropriate details are entered on the tag. B, explain the difference between a 10 kilowatt pump motor that's been isolated and a 10 kilowatt motor pump that's been switched off. Well, isolated means that it's been deliberately disconnected from the supply and there's certain precautions that have been taken on to make sure that it can't be reconnected. So there can't be an ac accidental reconnection of an isolated um, appliance like this pump. Whereas if it's just switched off, we've turned off the electricity to the supply of the motor, but it can be easily switched back on again. Proof test proof to ensure isolation. So really need to know this. We check that the instrument is okay on a known life source. We test for isolation to confirm or otherwise that it's isolated. And then we test the instrument again on another or on the same life source as the, as the first stage to ensure that it's still operating correctly. So you make sure your meter's working correctly, you check for isolation, and then you make sure again that your meter is still working. You're testing for voltage at the supplier side of a three-phase main switch to see if the switchboard is isolated. What tests would you make to clearly establish that isolation has taken place? So it's, it's no good just going between phase and neutral. You need to go between phase and neutral and phase and earth. You need to make sure that both of those are at, at zero volts. If you only did one and we had a bad earth, there could still be a phase there. So you need to check between phase and neutral as well. Why would a resistor be connected across a circuit after the electricity supply to that circuit has been isolated? Well, it's to allow the stored energy, generally in a, in a capacitor, um, to be dissipated before you work on it so that you can't get a, an electric shock. So the resistor will dissipate any energy that's been stored in the circuit.